All right, this is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt, Chapter 21, East Asia and Global Perspective, Section 4, From Ming to Qing. So both of these, Ming and Qing, these are Chinese dynasties. The Ming ruling from 1368 to 1644, and the Qing, which followed it, ruled from 1644 to 1912. Um, the Ming Empire, we're not going to talk too much about it, but one important thing to take note of, especially the difference between the Ming and the Qing, is that the Ming Empire was ethnically a Chinese empire. Its capital city was Beijing, where the emperor resided. The palace was called the Forbidden City, so a right of Beijing. That this was the capital city and the Forbidden Palace. And the Forbidden Palace served very much like the palace in Versailles, the top copy palace in, uh, in Istanbul for the Ottoman sultans, the castle at Edo or Tokyo where the Japanese shogun resided. Uh, it was entirely where um, you know, the emperor not just lived, but also administrated the rest of the government. And like we talked about in some previous chapters, you know, the Chinese were known especially for their trade goods, you know, ceramic and silk. So these were trade goods really sought by everyone. Um, especially Europeans during the Age of Exploration. The whole reason why Columbus sailed west into the Atlantic was to get his hands on some of these goods. However, by the 1500s to you know the 1600s, the Ming is experiencing significant decline. Uh, famine in part caused by the, well, not quite yet, we'll get to that point in a little bit, but uh, famine caused by uh, some of the negative consequences of having an emperor isolated in the Forbidden Palace, silver inflation, of course this is silver coming in from the New World. The Ming Empire was forced to resort to paper money, which China has a bad history with paper money. It devastated the economy in some of the decades and centuries prior. Uh, paper money led to inflation and ultimately corruption among government officials. So there was plenty of internal problems, but really the uh, Achilles heel, you might say, for the Ming dynasty was on the outside, uh, rebellions and threats. Uh, the Mongols, Mongols are nomadic people to the north of China. Uh, the Chinese were frequently engaged in war with the Mongols. In fact, the entire establishment of the Ming Dynasty was through the defeat of the Mongols. And the Chinese dedicated a lot of resources to protecting their northern border. Uh, you might know this, or probably most famously, by the Great Wall of China, which had existed before the Ming Dynasty. But the Ming's invested a lot of money into protecting their northern border. Mongol confederations in the late Ming period became united under the Dalai Lama, who was a spiritual, uh, we might call him religious leader, and unified under the rule of Goldan, who was a political leader. And so this was, of course, you can think of the Mongols as being the Ming Dynasty's kind of arch nemesis, the fact that they were uh, spiritually and religiously united, that there was a strong political leader leading some Mongol federations. This was, of course, all a bigger threat to the Ming Empire. Additionally, the Ming and their retreat from the ocean recall the voyages of Zheng Ha and how the Ming early on explored overseas, but more or less retreated. Uh, the Ming really had no way to deal with pirates because they had no uh, presence on the ocean. So pirates maybe uh, attacked 
slash disrupted the Ming economy again with very little ability to fight back. The Imjin War that we talked about in the previous chapter or previous section, this was a war with Japan, right? That led the Ming uh, to be in a very weakened state. Eventually, some of the northern Ming generals made um, treaties and alliances with the Manchu minority population. So Manchuria is essentially northern China. And to be a Manchu is to be from that region, right? So it's an ethnicity. Uh, the Ming Empire was in such a weakened state that a group of Manchus essentially took over the throne and established a new empire, right? The Qing Empire, which was ruled a Manchu minority over a Chinese majority. Right, over a Chinese majority. So that's what the biggest difference is. You can think of in the Ming Dynasty and the Qing. The Ming Dynasty is mostly Chinese. The Qing Dynasty is Manchu. Again, a small portion of the population, but they're the ones in control over a large Chinese population. So under the Qing Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty really thrived under the Emperor Kangxi. Kangxi, you see here, reigned from 16, uh, sorry, 1662 to 1722. We could say both of Kangxi and the Kuanglong Emperor, who ruled from 1736 to 1769, that this was the golden age of Qing rule. Uh, much like rulers in other parts of the world, Kanji was a child emperor, and for his younger years, a regent, or you know maybe like an administrator, uh, called the shots, but when Kanji came of age, he actually executed or killed his regent. Uh, thus securing his position as the single ruler there in China, uh, killing those who threaten your power within, you know, the administrative structure was not unusual at all, uh, you know, all across the world at this time. And of course, for the Qing dynasty, the biggest threat perhaps were on its borders, both Russians and Mongols. If we go to our map here, we can get kind of an idea of where we're talking about in comparison with uh, with China here. So. If we look at Beijing, that was the uh, Ming capital right there. But in fact, most of the population of China live along these rivers. You have the Yangzhi. Uh, it looks like it's labeled the Wang or sometimes called the Yellow River here. That's really the agricultural basis for China where a large portion of the population is. You can see Manchuria. That's where the Qing rulers came in and took over, established themselves as a Chinese dynasty the Mongol threat, of course, that exists here, and then the Russian Empire. And this is really what the Qing are essentially contending with. Uh, the Qings eventually incorporate a large part of territory, right? This all becomes in some way under Qing control. Some of the Turkish regions in Central Asia, Tibet comes under Qing control all the way down, all the way down here. And so you can see that this was an empire that covered a lot of ground, but also covered a lot of ethnicities. In regards to their diplomacy with the Russians, uh, the Amur River became the dividing line between Russia and China. So this became the border between Russia and China. The Russians, of course, wanted to protect their fur trade in uh, northern Siberia. The Chinese wanted to protect their own borders, but the Amur River is, you see it's right up in this region here, it looks like. Um, and that became, in some sense, the dividing line. The Treaty of Nershinx was the one that established that. So we might just go ahead and just say about this treaty. We'll just point up here, right? It established the border between China and Russia. And when it came to the Mongol threat, rather than dealing with it diplom in, a, in a diplomatic way, uh, the Qing dealt with it in a very more aggressive way. Inner Mongolia was annexed by the Qing. And so this territory here of Mongolia uh, thus came under Qing rule. If you're curious uh, what this blue line represents in this map here, 
Uh, that's just showing you where the rainfall line is. In other words, everywhere in the green here, there's enough rainfall to uh, provide some agricultural output beyond this line that's drawn right here. That's where you get kind of the more nomadic cultures, cultures that are based more in herding than they are rather in farming. So the Qing Dynasty, very, very, very big. In terms of its diplomatic missions with outside Europeans, Canton was set up as a, or really set up as the only trading city for Europeans. Uh, we had talked about previously Macau, that was also a trading city with the Portuguese. But for the most part, Canton was one of the cities delegated to trade with outsiders. And the Chinese wanted to make sure that there weren't a lot of European merchants coming in and not a lot of Jesuits becoming in because they didn't want that influence infiltrating the Chinese mainland. However, Canton eventually was more or less dominated by the British East India Company. Certainly by the 1700s, the British took over Dutch influence. You know, the Dutch were very, very uh, influential in this overseas trade. And so when it came to dealing with China, it, you know, the British were the ones who were mainly pushing the envelope, so to speak. The British wanted tea, which was a highly sought after trade goods. So we might say about tea, the British wanted to trade with China. And it wasn't just about obtaining tea, but also a very important part about China is the population or what we call the market. It was more the ability to sell things to China um, because China was a country that really only accepted silver as a commodity and refused a lot of other commodities to come in. The population of China was three times that of Europe. And for all of those people that were there, they were potential buyers and being potential buyers is a good way to uh, you know, really make a business thrive. So it wasn't just about obtaining goods, but it was also about selling goods. The McCartney mission was an effort by Great Britain, effort by Britain to open up China to trade. Uh, McCartney, the British delegate, when he arrived to the Qing emperor, he refused to perform the kowtow. Might say the British refused. And the result was China, China rejected this effort. Said that there would be no uh, altercations to trading policies. Europeans would still only be allowed to trade with China on a limited basis. Uh, and simply the Chinese said, look, we don't want anything that you have to offer. Uh, it's a very interesting sort of diplomatic point historically, because 50 years down the line or so, the British are essentially going to force their way into China, um, you know, militarily. Here in the 1790s, where I think 1790s is when the McCartney mission takes place. I might have to go back and check the date of that. Actually, I'll check it right now. Uh, 1793, right, was when the McCartney mission took place. Uh, essentially, the Qing were in a powerful enough position that they could, you know, reject the British advance. Whereas 50 years down the road, when the British essentially want to do the same thing, now the British have the upper hand militarily. And we'll talk about how you eventually get to that point. But at least here, uh, the Qing dynasty is in a strong enough position to tell the British to get lost. And essentially, all these other countries like the Dutch and the Russians and the French, who also want to increase trade, the Chinese also tell them to get lost, and they're really not in a position to do anything about it. Uh, however, for the Qing dynasty, like I said, it was a large and very populous um, empire. Uh, corn and potatoes made their way to China. These were new world crops, which led to more population. You know, the Qing dynasty in like 1700 had the same population as the United States today. A lot of that put stress on the environment with deforestation. A lot of that led to internal rebellions. We might just say of the Qing dynasty that it was too, you know, too big uh, and too populous. And that led to a lot of issues uh, leading to the decline and weakening of the Qing dynasty into the 1800s and into the 1900s.